Part sixteen of Collected Prose by James Elroy Flecker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. John Davidson. One. I have only had the privilege of talking to one great poet in my life, and that was John Davidson. He was somewhat like one of his own ballads in appearance, fiery, impenitent, yet subdued to convention, the eyeglass seeming to assert a right to aristocracy, the well-trimmed imperial hinting at eccentric elegance. He was in all ways a self-confident, ostentatious man. His egoism showed in his handwriting, which sloped upwards to the right across the page at a terrific angle. It shows in almost every line of his poetry, in the very audacity and splendour of his image. And out of time's obscure distress, the conquering scherzo thundered day. His poetry, unjustly neglected as it is, does not require very detailed criticism. He was, after all, the greatest poet of his age, but it was not a glorious age. Poetry was dead. Swinburne had written the immortal Ave Aque Vale, and somehow therewith, had sung hail and farewell to his own inspiration and the splendid Victorian muse. The names and traditions of the Victorian epoch should be banished as aretta, things too holy or unholy to be spoken, from the pages of a journal which encourages young British poets. After forty years, these gigantic shadows still oppress us. I must trust entirely to my memory, but I believe that in twenty years' interval were published The House of Life, Omar Khayyam, The Scholar Gypsy, Dramatic Lyrics, The Princess, and Atalanta in Caledon, any one of which masterpieces, even The Princess, would have dominated the whole succeeding period from their age to ours. In those days, William Morris and Christina Rossetti were minor poets. For all the imperishable work done since their time by Houseman and by Yeats, by Kipling and by John Davidson himself, for all the progress in artistic taste made by our younger generation, who at least never write such vulgar rubbish as Loxley Hall, nor such obscure rubbish as Pacchiarotto, we know that English poetry is awaiting another dawn, and that we poets of today are but torch-bearers in a twilight. John Davidson realised, I think, for all his mask of aggressive self-confidence, that his poetry, judged by the hard standard of his immediate predecessors, was a failure and it embittered him. But it is only when measured by that hard standard that his poetry fails. The world will always read those virile and impetuous ballads. They have a cadence of bronze, and their effects are those of a rhetoric which imagination, and sometimes insolence, has transmuted into poetry. Charming as are his Fleet Street Eclogues, and also some of his short lyrics, the ballads are his great achievement. He might have added to them, for they are but few, collected them, pruned them of many harsh or feeble expressions, but he suddenly lost all interest in his lyric work. The peculiar curse of the British author had fallen upon him. He discovered the secret of the universe, and he felt a call to make the discovery universal. He began to preach, and to preach in blank verse, and he abused the critics who preferred what he now called the tinkle of his rhyme, to what he thought was the important splendour of his new metre. John Davidson was a man of great genius, but of still greater ambition. His ambition ruined his genius, and his preachings in blank verse, despite their gorgeous imagery, even despite occasional humour and originality, are failures. They fail owing to the crudeness of the poetical ideas and the technical inferiority of the verse. Tennyson, and in later years Mr. Stephen Phillips in Marpessa and Mr. Yeats, have cleverly turned blank verse to purely lyrical uses. Swinburne, with his rows of monosyllables, gave his blank verse a heavy beat, which was a fine device when his inspiration soared, and an intolerable trick when it flagged. But the last master of blank verse was Browning. All through the interminable meanderings of the ring and the book, the technical excellence of the blank verse never fails, and at its greatest can be measured with Shakespeare's only. To get at the reason of success or failure in blank verse is the hardest task of criticism. 
take the following lines from the testament of john davidson at sunset on the mountain of my choice i stood above the catafalque of day and watched the quilted vapours harness heaven and chrysolite and ruby of countless hues unnamed unknown unthought of only guessed upon the moment of vicissitude and pulsing cadence while the lofty winds unseen battalions swung their shining glaives against me and across the hills behind with bridle bells appeal and vibrant tread went down into the gloaming and the night this is all very magnificent and somehow not worth any three lines of browning you can set your eyes on some interchange of grace some splendour once the very thought some benediction anciently they smile these chrysolites and rubies these unseen battalions could pass off well enough in rhyme insert any nonsense the lofty winds were striding through the waves unseen battalions swung their shining glaives against me and across the hills behind with pulsing cadence a more lofty wind with bridal bells appeal and vibrant tread went down into the gloaming and the dead how much happier are the fine phrases with the discipline of rhyme however foolish to add to their elegance and excuse their bravado for rhyme in its subtle way gives them or at least the final word of them a reason for existence blank verse to repeat old truisms must be written not only as carefully as rhymed verse but must aim at a quite different impression it must be written in paragraphs and not for the effect of single lines john davidson sins i think even against these old and obvious rules yet there is something deeper than their strict observance needed to enable even the good poet to make good blank verse i think of shakespeare webster milton as well as browning when i say that it is something like a latent but ever watchful sense of humour meanwhile even as a man's character is laid bare in his cups so a poet's intellect is betrayed by his blank verse john davidson was a well-read but not a well-educated man he felt an imperious desire to assert himself and began to preach in his new blank verse with prose prefaces a crude egoism and a peculiarly childish materialism the disaster is of course not that he should have believed this or that a great poet may be a crude catholic like crashaw or a crude protestant like milton the disaster is that john davison bores us with his beliefs having nothing but a lot of rhetoric about passionate molecules and atomic pairs to cover up its bare and very ugly skeleton these latter works are no longer of john davidson the poet but of john davidson from perth in scotland two almost all the chief poets of the last hundred years have been comparatively rich men or at least have not been forced to struggle bitterly for a bare existence byron shelley tennyson matthew arnold browning swinburne were all men in fairly easy circumstances when there has been misery and poverty in the lives of poets of coleridge and keats for example it has usually had an effect adverse to their genius this generalization could be tested in other climes and other times and would i believe admit very few exceptions nor can i think of any poets save villon and verlaine who drew directly inspiration from the distress of a vagabond existence yet the public still excuses itself from its obvious duty towards poets by hypocrisies concerning the beneficial effect of the struggle for life when the struggle for life is almost over and the poetic inspiration has been worn away by misery the unfortunate genius is sometimes accorded as an arms and not as an honour a pension about equal to a footman's wage one of the meanest tragedies in the history of english literature was the life and death of john davidson he bore heroically the most abject poverty and the pity of it is that one is convinced that had he been enabled since the days when he published his first plays so full of life and promise to lead an ordinary decent life of ease and comfort perhaps to travel and air his genius in a wider world he might have become a far greater poet and might have dominated his age for the advantage of english letters he would have lost that rude savagery of nature which made him rant materialism like a hyde park missionary 
as it happened his pension such as it was came too late i think he felt too that his muse was dead he imagined rightly or wrongly that his health was undermined he had been a brave man all his life and he was brave enough to commit suicide as his body could not at first be found the british public heard for the first time from their newspapers that there was a poet called john davidson and so the world goes on and millionaires leave their millions to found public libraries to be filled with the books that men wrote and are writing still in misery untended sickness or at best in hours stolen from uncongenial toil books too which would have been more bravely penned were great writers able now to live as they lived in rome or greece like gentlemen when such vast funds are instantly subscribed not only by millionaires for libraries but by the most generous and most thoughtless public in the world for any specious and elusive charity the daily papers choose to encourage cannot a few thousands be collected to publish the books if not to prolong the lives of those who like john davidson write not for ten thousand to read in ten days but for ten more wise men to read every year for ever end of part sixteen